uh, 1 Samuel, I wanted to start a new book today, and then I realized how long those videos were, and I thought, there's no way I can start a new book with the time I'm going to have allotted to me, which is about 15 minutes. So I plan to preach about 15 minutes, but it's not the book I'm going to preach next week. Next week, we're going to start a new book on Sunday afternoons, uh, but I'm going to hit you with the thought that I had as I was reading through my Bible again, and uh, it just struck me, so I'm going to give it to you. I believe it's what the Lord have for us uh, this evening. It's one that's been convicting me, so maybe it'll convict you too. I guess that's the hope. Let's stand together. Uh, 1 Samuel 13, sorry. Really, yeah, 13. Go to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. The big 1-3. This, is it that big? I don't know. It doesn't sound as big as 75 as Brother Frank. But the big 1-3. Really, I just have you turn to, to chapter 13 so you can read the last um, couple of verses of chapter 13. And then our text is actually 14. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 22. Stand with me. The Bible says, So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. Here's our text. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistine garrison that, it, that is on the other side. But he told not his father. This is important. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiai, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of, the, of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you'd use this message in a timely manner to speak to our hearts here on a Sunday afternoon. I uh, ask so that you'd use, uh, uh, use my mind, clear it out, so I'd say only what you'd have for me to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks for standing. Ooh, that projector warmed my water right up. Mmm. <laughs> Warm water. I've titled the message tonight, We're Too Comfortable. We are too comfortable. Amen. Having come back from two weeks of camp, I have come to appreciate the things in my house a whole lot more. Yeah. I have a very comfortable king-sized mattress in my bedroom. And it felt so much more comfortable in comparison to the mattresses that sit on the plywood in the dorms that are this thick. Made me really appreciate the comfort there. Um, if you've never been to Silver State, you know this. The showers all have pull chains. So if you need to shower, you pull the chain, you get water with no adjustment. So it's hot, cold, whatever temperature it is, that's what you're getting. And then you let go and you soap and you rinse and you soap. And of course, the shower heads are this high. For some of y'all, that's really convenient. For some of us, that's really inconvenient. <laughs> it made me appreciate the comfort of turning a shower to the right temperature. Yeah. And just the double head shower fixture in our shower that can get all angles. And it's like six and a half feet tall. So even at six foot one, I get in and I'm not even close to the shower head. And it was so magical taking a shower in that situation. And believe it or not, our padded pews are real comfortable. And I know some people are like, well, it could have a pad on the back. And No, go sit on a half of a log on the hillside for about an hour and 20 minutes. And then you come to appreciate this with the fan in the comfortable air. Lots of comforts. Now, by the way, I'm not complaining. I, I'm glad we're Americans. I'm glad we have comfortable things. I'm glad my truck's comfortable. I'm glad our pews are comfortable. I'm glad my couch is comfortable. I'm glad my bed is comfortable. I'm very happy for comfort. Here's the one problem with comfort. It is the great enemy of progress. Comfort is the great enemy of progress. When we get real comfortable, it stops us from doing things that take us out of our comfort zone. And anyone can fall into this trap of getting comfortable. By the way, it's not just in church. I, well, let me be clear. You can get real comfortable in your marriage to where you don't work hard. You don't work for your wife's love and attention. Uh, you don't work to 
bring honor and respect to your husband. You can get real comfortable being a parent where you don't work to raise godly children. You can get real comfortable at work where you no longer try to be the best you can be. You can get comfortable anywhere. But for our sake, let's talk spiritually. Let's talk spiritually. We only got about 10 minutes to do it. So I'm going to give you a really quick background because here in our passage, King Saul got too comfortable. Now, chapter 13 is the infamous chapter, if you know about King Saul, and I'm going to take a lot of this Sunday afternoon crowd for granted, and I apologize for that. If, a lot, if anything I say doesn't make sense, you can ask me about it afterwards, or just read Samuel 13 through about 15, and everything I say throughout this message will make sense. But chapter 13 is the infamous passage where Saul got impatient waiting for the prophet Samuel, so he stepped out of his job of, as king and tried to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. Samuel comes and really gets on his case about it. He was not supposed to do that. He got impatient, stepped out of uh, what he was supposed to be doing, and that was the beginning of the fall of Saul. That, I mean, he really, he had a lot of problems, but that was the beginning of the fall because that was when Samuel comes to him in chapter 13 and says, the God is going to tear the kingdom from you. He's going to take the kingdom away from you. For all we know, if Saul had messed up there, God had a plan to use the lineage of Saul as king forever in Israel. But because of this point, now understand, this point just happened in 13. Verse, or chapter 14 is the same place. We're still dealing at Michmash with the Philistines. So he just made a big, uh-oh, no, no, got in trouble, and then now we jump into our text, and we find out in verse number two, that instead of going to war, which is where the kings are supposed to be, if you were a king in this time, you did not sit in your throne in Israel and send people to war, you were in war with them. In fact, usually, and part of the reason they picked Saul, Saul was head and shoulders above all others. He was a big, burly, strong man that looked like he could handle himself in a fight, and that was something that was appealing. I wish we still picked presidents like that. I think that'd be kind of cool. Instead, we get uh, senile, decrepit, I mean, did I say that? I mean, older, more seasoned politicians. Great. Anyways, um, so they picked him because he was real big. He was supposed to be at the front of the battle, but I'm going to reread verse 2. Read it with me. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. The question I want to pose to you really quickly is why was Paul, or why was Paul, Saul sitting under a pomegranate tree instead of going to battle with the Philistines? Well, the reason wasn't easy to find. I mean, a lot of times in the Bible, you've got to ask yourself that question, why, and then start diving into it. And I, as, I, as I read through this, and that question came to my mind as I was reading through my Bible, and I thought to myself, okay, why? That's a good question to why. ask. Why? Why is Saul sitting under a pomegranate tree? So that led me to go backwards, read some from behind, continue to read forward, and I found a lot of reasons. You're like, great. But for the sake of time, I think all those reasons can be summed up in three major big reasons that left Paul, or I keep saying Paul, that left Saul on the sidelines instead of at the front of the battle. So I'm going to give those to you quickly. Number one, the first glaring problem that kept Saul on the sideline was that he valued his comfort over God's cause. He valued his comfort over God's cause. We just read verse 2, find out that he's under a pomegranate tree. Saul, we find out, was on the edge of Gibeah. Now, I know just reading that you wouldn't catch that, but verse 2 is very telling. Saul is not only not where he should have been as king, so there would have been a garrison. A garrison was like the scout post for an army. There would have been a garrison scout post uh, uh, right here, uh, let's say in Michmash or at the edge, and then in here coming up toward, there should have been an outpost a garrison of, of Israelites where they were actually fairly close and the king is really close to that. He gets told what's going on right there and then tells everybody behind him. What the passage told us without going into great detail was that he was at the uttermost part of Gibeah. Instead of being at the front where the king was supposed to be just behind his garrison to where he could gather all the information of the battle and then do something about it, he in fact went to the very far side, as far away from the, uh, from the battle possible with being able to say, I'm still here. I'm still here. It's like, uh, I don't know, when you walk into church after everything started, and then you bail out real quick, and you never get really past that first long pew. It's, you're here, technically. You were there, right? 
I was where I was supposed to be. But the realization is you never actually were all in where you're supposed to be. You never stepped past the back. He never actually got really into the battle. You say, why was that? Well, very simply, his comfort was more important to him than God's cause. God, God wanted the Philistines defeated. You say, why is that? Well, the Philistines are always a picture of the flesh in the Bible. That's what the P Philistines are always a picture of flesh. Moab, Moab and Moabites are always a picture of sin. Philistines are always a picture of flesh. If you ever see them, there you got it. It's always, that is the picture God's making. God always wants the Philistines defeated for whatever they're doing that's wrong. They're coming up strong against the Israelites. And Saul, uh, in chapter 13, knew he should have done something about it. Got impatient, offered a sacrifice when he shouldn't have. Got in trouble and said, okay, well, you know what then? I'm just going to sit back here and do nothing about it. I'm going to sit back here and stay comfortable. It is easy for us to get comfortable in our pew, isn't it? Our pews are not actually the place of battle. They're very much like Gibeah. It is where we prepare for battle and charge forward. I'm glad you're here in a pew. I hate that there's not more here in these pews that should be. But I'm glad you're here in a pew. But can I tell you, don't get too comfortable in the pew. This isn't the battleground. We can be just like Saul and say, well, I'm real comfortable here. There's no conviction here. Or there is conviction and I've just learned to ignore it. And I've seared my conscience with a hot iron. Uh, I... I know there's things I could be doing. There's places I should be going. There's people I should be inviting. There's things I should be doing for the Lord. But I come to church. And Saul could sit back and say, well, at least I'm on the battlefield. I'm just real comfortable here. And God's cause is the farthest thing from his mind. In fact, he makes sure to pick a pomegranate tree, a nice, juicy, good pomegranate tree that he can really en enjoy himself while he's there. But like Saul, many, many of us are too comfortable to be bothered by God's cause. Number two, second glaring problem that kept Saul on the sideline was that he was overly focused on what he didn't have rather than what he did have. He was overly focused on what he did have rather than what he did have. I had you read it at the beginning, but I'm going to read chapter 13, verse 22. It says this. So it came to pass in the day of battle, so the day of battle comes, that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. Now go again into verse 2 of our passage, and we find out, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. So I know this is a lot, I'm, I'm trying to cover a lot very quickly. Uh, in chapter 13, 3,000 men went with Saul and Jonathan. For whatever reason, 600 of them are still with Saul. But here's a big problem. None of them have weapons, except for Saul and Jonathan. Who would say that's a problem in a battle? I'm not going to a gunfight unarmed. And yet, that's essentially what most every man with him, 3,000 men besides Saul and Jonathan, did not have a weapon. We find out in chapter 13, what they did was they took farming tools and sharpened them to the best of their ability We're talking ox goads and rakes and whatever they used to farm they just sharpened the tips of it and that's what they had because they didn't have a blacksmith in uh, israel to make weapons with the philistines tried to make sure of that long story short he's sitting there thinking why would i bother even going into battle when there's only three thousand of us and uh, I could read real quick. In, in chapter 13, it lets us know in verse 5, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. That sounds like quite an army, doesn't it? Just the horses alone and the people that rode horses alone outnumbered the people that were there with Saul and Jonathan. So Saul and John, or Saul, Saul sits back and, and, I, and, and this is what, all I can gather from what I'm reading. He starts to focus most likely on all the things he doesn't have. Why would I bother going to battle? I don't have a sword. Or all my men don't have a sword. I don't have enough men. We don't have horses. We don't have chariots. We don't have an army that's numbered in the sand, as many people as the sands of the sea. So why even try? See, is that important? Well, yeah, because we do it all the time. Oh, well, we don't have a piano player. I can't, can't do that. Oh, we don't have a staff guy. I can't do that. Oh, I, we don't have a big church. We really can't try that. We don't have a lot of people. We really shouldn't try that. And so we look at, instead of saying, God wants to do something with us. By the way, Jonathan did. He goes and takes out the whole garrison that I was talking about with him and his armor bearer. If you read the story, it's really silly. If I were that armor bearer, I'd find somebody new to bear armor for because so, Jonathan sounds crazy. Read it. It's fun. I don't have time to get into it. But we can get real comfortable and just say, why should we even try? Hey, we live in a rural community. Could we really ever expect that we would run 70, 80, 90 people here? Probably not. So why even bother trying? 
We're never going to have this. We're never going to have the music they have. We're never going to have the choir they have. We're never going to have uh, the soul winning programs. We're never going to have the discipleship programs. We don't have all the resources. We don't even have a bus or a van. So why should we even try? And let me tell you, when you start to focus on what you don't have instead of what you do have, God cannot use you. Saul was so focused on what he didn't have that he was not able to be used. Jonathan said, hey, I got, I got a shield, a sword, and an armor bearer. Let's go see what God will do. And lo and behold, God did something. I've got to hurry. Number three. Number three. The last glaring problem that kept Saul on the sideline was he was still having a pity party over losing the kingdom. As I said in chapter 13, Saul made a big mistake and Samuel rebuked Saul and told him that the king, his kingdom would not continue. Now because Saul is really only focused on Saul, by the way, that's pretty much the narrative of Saul. If you don't know, if I could summarize Saul's life as narcissistic, self-indulgent, loser. Best as I could explain it narcissistic, self-indulgent loser. How do you know that? Uh, there's a point where David is in his court, plays music for him and relaxes him. And then when David kills Goliath, he goes, who's that guy? So how does that happen? It's not because he forgot that David ever played music for him. It's because he was so self-indulgent that he never even knew David was in his courts playing music for him anyway. Saul was so, here he is, here he is. He's, he just got scolded by the prophet, by the preacher. And he goes, well... If God's going to take the kingdom away from me anyway, why should I even try? See, is that really in there? I, it's not really in there. I, this is my answers to why. But I've got to believe that, that that just happened probably a day ago is still on his mind. This, the prophet just told him, you no longer get to continue as king of Israel. Now, he does go on to continue as king, but he knows my son will never rule in my stead. My grandson will never rule in my throne. It is done. So if it's done, why should I even try? Some here are still busy having pity parties about other things instead of staying on the mission at hand. Now, I was actually about, to, I was going to get into some things we could have pity parties on. And to be honest, I was really afraid I was going to offend somebody. Not meaning to. Now, I know what the Bible says. Perfect peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. I've been corrected very often. In fact, I've been corrected even probably last week by a preacher. I don't get offended about it. I'm thankful for it. Here's the reality. I'm so worried of offending people. I didn't put anything specific in there. Say, really? Is that what you should have done? No, I probably should just say it, but I'm too scared. So I'm just going to say, some here are still having pity parties about something. You name it. You, I mean, I'm sure the Lord will bring it to your mind. You're, you're so worried. Well, preacher said I couldn't do that. Or the pastor said I couldn't do this. Or we're not doing this. Or I think this would be really great. And why don't we implement this? And, and, and he told me not to do this. Or I got here and nobody was here. And I got this and nothing happened. And, and so why should I even try? Well, with that mind, you're already defeated. And you, you're not going to be much use for God. God isn't telling you to quit or to give up. He might be seeing how much you're willing to go through for Him. First two years of ministry really quick was very hard for Holly and I. We almost quit the ministry multiple times. I'm not saying that to say anything about us. It was all God. God allowed us on the same day never to be where we wanted to quit on the same day. Praise the Lord. Only by His grace. Because if Holly and I on the same day had got home and said, I'm done, we would have been done. I would have found a job, I would have bought a house, I would have been living probably in Artesia or Carlsbad, I'd been working a secular job, and I'd have been just fine being a church member somewhere. That's where we were. You say, why are you saying all this? If I'd have sat back and had pity parties about all the bad things happening to me in my first couple years of ministry, I'd never be standing here today in a position of tremendous blessing. Not, not just being a pastor, I mean, as a person, I am tremendously blessed only because I didn't focus on all the bad things that happened. I just focused on what God wanted to do with me in the future. And I just tried to let him use me. So there it is for you. A quick message to encourage you not to give up, not to get discouraged, and stop being comfortable on the sidelines. Any one of those glaring problems could cause you to stop working or fighting for God. So here it is very simply. Don't get comfortable outside the battle. Some of you are here and you're like, hey, I'm here. I'm at church. This isn't the battle. Don't get so comfortable here that you don't go out there. Number two, don't get overly focused on what we don't have. Just focus on what we do. Say, well, we don't have a crazy active youth ministry. We'll work for that then. 
You be the person to initiate it. Well, we don't have a ton of people. Well, people bring in people. Sheep make sheep. Now, I'm not trying to get too deep on you there. A shepherd, an under-shepherd, doesn't procreate and make sheep. I know biology is really hard for y'all. <laughs> sheep make sheep. Amen. If, you don't want, if you don't like the amount of people in the pew, yes, I probably make mistakes and probably run some off and scare some or say something I shouldn't. But the reality is, you are the person that will get more people here. And I, by the way, I'm not just excusing myself. I do try as well. And lastly, don't have a pity party over things. Just keep moving forward for God. So what if I offended you? No, really. I know. No, no, I know that's like a hot button. No, you should be. Who cares? Guess what? I'm dumb. I'm brutish in the words of Ron Jones. I'm 28 years old. My brain has barely been developed for three years. Do you realize that? Fully developed for three years. That's the reality. I'm going to offend you. I, I guarantee you, and I probably should apologize, these last two weeks, a lot of stuff had to have fallen through the cracks. You say, why? Because I was at camp. I can't multiply myself. Well, so-and-so offended me. Okay. It's going to happen. Friction. Two moving parts. You're going to get offended. Grace makes it all better. Don't throw a pity party. Just say, hey, there's still my brother and sister in Christ. We're still, we still really want the same goal. Let's just keep moving forward for the goal. Don't get too comfortable outside the battle. Don't get overly focused on what we don't have. Just focus on what we do have. Don't have a pity party over things. Keep moving forward for God. Let's all bow our heads. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed.